day we thank you that we have the opportunity to rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you, Father God, that we have been able to assemble in your presence. We have sung our songs of praise. We have lifted up our voices in prayer unto you. And now, our Heavenly Father, we come to you, Father God, that you might speak to us. For we know that your words are the words of life, and we know that your words are the words of eternal life. Father God, for by, the, by your word you created the heavens and the earth. And Father God, by your word you can change any situation in our lives. Our Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would now speak to your people by your word. Speak to their hearts. And Father God, change anything in us. Father God, that needs to be changed. That we may live our lives to your glory, to your honor. And Father God, to our blessing. Our Father, we love you. Our Father, we thank you. We ask this things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's a word for us this morning. It's taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 33, where I am going to read to you verses 1 through 11 from the New King James Version of the Holy Bible. And it reads, now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him were four hundred men. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maid servants. And he put the maid servants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. And he lifted his eyes and saw the women and children and said, Who are these with you? So he said, The children whom God has graciously given yourself. Then the maid servants came near and their children and bowed down. And Leah also came near with her children and they bowed down. Afterward, Joseph and Rachel came near and they bowed down. Then Jesus said, What do you mean by all this company which I met? And he said, These are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Jesus said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, No, please. If I have found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand, inasmuch as I have seen your face, as though I have seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. Please take my blessing that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have it not. So he urged him, and he took it. I want to talk to us this morning from the subject, Love Conquers All. Love Conquers All. The movie clip that we watched just before this sermon was a clip from the movie Courageous. The movie begins with a scene that is common and ordinary in all of our everyday lives. It is the scene of a man pumping gas at the gas station. But all of a sudden, what begins as an ordinary scene becomes extraordinary. A car thief, given the slightest opportunity, attempts to steal the truck. The father runs after the truck. He jumps on it and he hangs on for dear life as the would-be thief speeds off and keeps swerving the truck in an attempt to throw him off. But despite the great danger to his life, the man hangs on to the truck until the desperate thief loses control and crashes on the roadside. The man is thrown from the truck as it crashes and the thief is injured. A passerby seeing this extraordinary scene unfolding before her eyes, she comes to the man's rescue 
And she asked him why he did not just let go of the truck. After all, it was just a truck. To which the man responded, I don't care about the truck. And the screenshot cuts away to the inside of the truck where a little baby lay in a car seat. The thief had stolen the man's truck, not realizing that the man's baby was in the back seat. And the father, knowing that the thief was about to drive off with his baby, was willing to do anything, including risking his own life to save the baby. The father loved his baby so much that he overcame all fear, all concerns, and all hindrances to save his child. The moral of the movie Courageous, and this scene in particular, is that fathers must do whatever it takes to save their children. But beyond that, it speaks of the great power that a father's love can have on the life of a child. It speaks of the great power that the love of our Heavenly Father unleashes in the lives of His own children. It speaks of the power of love. And it reminds us that love conquers all. Love conquers fear. Love conquers hate. Love conquers sin. Love conquers offense. Love conquers Satan. There is nothing in this world more powerful than love. For love conquers all. And that is what I have come to share with us as a church this morning. That love conquers all. The love of a father conquers all in the life of his children. The love of a mother can accomplish great things in the lives of the children. But on the other hand, the withholding of love from our children can bring great harm to their lives. So I come to remind us today, not just as it relates to our families and our children, but also as it relates to our spiritual family, as it relates to us as a church, that we must remember we must hide it in our hearts that love conquers all. The greatest law that God has given us as his children is the law of love. The greatest law that God has given us as his children is that we are to love God with all our hearts, all of our soul, all of our mind, and that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. We are to love one another. We are to love one another, especially in the household of faith. Hate has no place among the children of God. And the Spirit of God has sent me to deliver a message to us, wherever you might find yourself as a child of God, that you would remember in your heart that love conquers all. Love conquers all is the title of today's sermon. And it is a continuation of our series of stuff in which we have been reminding us that we are one. The church is one. We are one as a people. And that if we are going to accomplish everything that God has called us to do, we must remember that we are one. A house that is divided against itself will not stand. A family that is divided against itself will surely fall. But we must remember that when we put love in our heart, and when we remember that love conquers all, and that love is the highest law that God has given us as His children, that we will be able to accomplish great things for God. That we will be able to do exceedingly abundantly, the Bible says, even way beyond anything that we can ever imagine in our lives, because the power of love is so great that it will take us to heights that we cannot imagine. The power of love in our life is so great that it will help us to accomplish what we cannot imagine. The power of love is so great that it will take us to levels that we have not even thought about. I thought I would remind us as a church this morning that love conquers all. 
right here in our church. We see the story of the reunion of two brothers who had been at odds for a very long time. Two brothers, Jacob and Esau, they were twins. They were twins, but because of sin that came up in their lives, Jacob deceived his brother. He deceived his brother and then stole his brother's birthright. Jacob, because of sin in his life, was not satisfied with stealing his brother's birthright. He went so far as to steal his brother's blessing. He pretended because he knew that their father Isaac was blind and he could not see. Jacob pretended that he was Esau and he connived with his mother and they put um, goat hairs on Jacob's arm because their father was blind but Esau was a hairy son. And they put the hairs of an animal on Joseph's arm so that when he went on Jacob's arm, so that when he went to his blind father, his blind father smelt him and felt him and felt the hair on his arms and he thought that, ja that, that Jacob was his older son, Esau. And he gave the blessing that was meant for his firstborn son to, to Jacob, not because Jacob deserved it, but because Jacob stole it. Jacob had done great harm. He had done great harm to his brother. He did not harm an outsider. Not that it would have been understandable if he had done that. But he had harmed the one who was closest to him. His own twin brother, he had stolen from him. He had wronged his brother deeply. And church, you know what he saw me? When he saw her about what, what Jacob had done. The Bible says that Esau went to his father. He ran to his father and said, Father, what about my blessing? Is there any blessing left for me? His father said, I've already given the blessing to your brother. And Esau hated Jacob from that day on. He hated Jacob in his heart because of what his brother had done to him. And Esau said, he said, our father is old. He said, I will wait until our father dies. And when our father dies, I will kill him. He said that. But the word got to Jacob's mother. And she was the one who planned the deception with her son anyway. So she told her son to run away. And Jacob ran away for many years. And would never again see his father at that point for many years or his brother. And right here in the text, we see the reunion of these two brothers. They have been separated for many years because of the wrong that one had done to the other. But here was Jacob. After all that he had done, the day of reckoning came when Jacob had to go home. And then he started going back. As he headed home, his heart was full of fear. He was afraid because he knew what he had done. He thought that surely when, I, when my brother meets me, that my brother will go ahead and try to take my life. But Jacob prayed. He prayed. He knew what he had done. He knew that he had wronged his brother. He said, God, be with me as I go. And God told him to go. And so we arrive at the scene that is recorded in our text. The Bible says that as Jacob, by this time, he had a family, a big family. He had gained great wealth in the place to which he ran. But now as he is going back home, the Bible says that he lifted up his eyes and looked at afar off. He saw his brother Esau coming. And Esau was coming with 400 men. And Jacob was afraid. He was afraid that Esau was coming to exact revenge. So look at what Jacob did. Jacob the trickster. Jacob, even though he was following God, that worldly way of doing things had not yet left his life. He was still
still trying to be a trickster. You know what he did? He divided his children up. He had two wives, Leah and Rachel. And he had children by two of their maid servants as well. So you know what he did? He took the maid servants and their children and he told them to be in front. Then he took Leah, the wife that he didn't really like that much, and he told her and her children to go next. Then the one that he loved the most, Rachel and Joseph, he put them behind. You know why he did that? He said in case Esau is angry, if Esau wants to start killing, let him kill the male servants and her children first. Maybe if he kills them, by that time, maybe Leah and the children will be able to escape her Rachel. But if he kills the male servants and their children, and Leah and her children are not able to escape, maybe he will kill them next. And I will still have Rachel, whom I love the most. <laughs> and, and Joseph, my most beloved son. Jacob is walking with God, but he has not yet learned that when you walk with God, you are either all in or all out. He's trying to walk with God and live with cunning at the same time. But the Bible says that eventually, after he had divided them, that at least Jacob did one thing that was good and manly. You know what he did? He went in front of them. He went in front of them and he saw his brother Esau coming from afar off with 400 men. And the Bible says that Jacob began to bow down. He began to bow to his elder brother, humbling himself as he sought the forgiveness of his brother. But eventually when Jacob comes and he meets Esau face to face, Jacob has the surprise of his life. Esau, his brother, who had hated him because of the wrong that he had done. The Bible says in verse 4 that Esau ran to meet Jacob. But he didn't run to meet Jacob, to kill Jacob like Jacob thought. He ran to meet him. He embraced him. He fell on his neck. He kissed him. And the two brothers wept. They wept because they had been divided from each other for so long out of fear of what would happen. But here they were. Love had conquered all. Love had conquered hate. Esau forgot about everything that his brother had done to him. He forgot what his brother took from him. He forgot that his brother had taken his birthright. He forgot that his brother had taken his blessing. He not know that he forgot it mentally, but he set it aside. He set it aside and he rushed to Jacob. He said, you are my brother. Love has conquered all. He embraced him. He fell on his neck. He kissed him. And both of them, ah. have you ever been separated for a long time from somebody you love? Have you ever been separated? Maybe because of seeing something you may have done or something they did to you. Have you ever been separated from your brother or your sister? Not only your brother or your sister in your biological family, but have you ever been separated from your brother or your sister in your spiritual family in the church of God? Because of what they did to you, or maybe because of what you did. I came to give us a message by the unction of the Holy Spirit that love conquers all. There's nothing that anybody can stop. Love conquers. You know what? If you when you read the text, Jacob stole Esau's blessing. But that did not stop God from blessing Esau. When Jacob came to Esau, he heard that Esau was coming with 400 men. We didn't read that part of the text, but if you read the preceding verses, Jacob said stuff to Esau. He thought that he was going to buy his way out. 
of the wrong that he had done. But as we read the text, you will find out in the verses that Esau, listen to what Esau says, put up if you will, verse 8. Esau asked Jacob, he said, what do you mean by all of this company that you have sent? Jacob said that I have sent all these things to you so that I may find favor in your sight. Then go on and look at verse 9. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. What he was saying is that you stole my birthright. You stole my blessing. But God has blessed me. Amen. How many people know that what God has for you is for you? Amen. Nobody can take what God has for you. Nobody can touch what God has appointed in your life. Jacob thought he had swindled his brother, but God blessed. He saw it. Jacob was a swindler. He was a con man. But when he expressed faith in God, look at the goodness of God. God had blessed Jacob too. God had blessed Jacob too. Jacob had no reason to steal from his brother because God had to bless him too. God had blessed Jacob If you read the text, see all what Jacob had said. To Esau, he had said so much because God had blessed him. And as we go on in the text, look at what Jacob says in verse 10. When Esau tells him to keep what he had, Jacob said, no, please. If I have found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand. In as much as I have seen your face, as though I have seen the face of God, and you are pleased with me, please take my blessing that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me. He had done wrong, but because our God is a God of love, God still blessed me. I want to talk to somebody who has done wrong. Maybe you have done wrong, and you think that the blessing of God is no longer. I come by to tell you that if you turn your heart to God, that God will bless you. Maybe somebody has done you wrong. If you turn your heart to God, God will bless you. There's no human being that can take what God has done. <coughs> There's no reason for us as God's children to envy one another. Because what is for you is for you. What is for me is for you. God is not going to run out of blessings to say that because He gave me, then He has to take away from you. What God has given to your brother, He can surely give it to you. Trust Him. And let the love of God fill your heart. Because love conquers. Love marks our relationship as children of God. We have a command to love one another. But we have a choice to love one another. The Bible tells us in the book of John, John 13, beginning in verse 33. Our Lord Jesus Christ tells us, He said that we have to love one another as He has loved us. It is a commandment from God that we who are His children have to love one another. But even though God has commanded us, we have a command to love one another, but we also have a choice to love one another. You know why? Because love is God's command. But God does not force us to love. Love is a choice that you must make for yourself. Because you know what God has done in your life. The Bible says that we love God, but we love Him. Why? Because He what? First loved us. 
Love is a choice in the life of the children of God. Esau had a choice to make. He could have killed Jacob or he could have loved him. He chose to love him. Jacob had a choice to make. He could have been fair to his brother or he could have hated him and, and robbed him. And guess what choice Jacob made? His choice was to cheat his brother. But the choice of his brother was to love him. Love is the command that we have from God. But love is a choice that Christians must Do you love your family? Do you love your children? Do you you love your parents? Do you love your brothers and your sisters? Do you love your friends? Do you love your church members? It's a choice that you must make. We have a command to love one another, but we also have a choice to love one another. These are chose to love Jacob. But Jacob, several years before, had chosen to do his brother wrong. But remember, whatever the case may be, that love conquers all. Love marks our relationships as children of God. But love mitigates our rifts as children of God. We are certain of conflict with one another as long as we are in this life until we get to heaven and are perfected there. We are going to have conflict with one another. It is the normal course in the lives of sinful men. We are certain of conflict with one another. But we are curtailed in conflict with one another. Love mitigates our risk as children of God. What does it mean that it mitigates our risk? It means that love constrains our behavior when we fall out with one another. Church, we are going to fall out with one another. Even people that you love, you are going to fall out with them. I have never seen a husband and a wife who have never had issues. I have never seen people who have been together for a long time without issues. Yes, some of our relationships are great and we don't have major issues, but we have some issues. Is that right? We are certain of conflicts with one another, but love mitigates our needs as children of God. We are curtailed. Conflict. What does it mean that we are fulfilled in conflict? It means that when we have love in our heart, it sets a limit on how far we will go. When you love another person, yes, they may have wronged you, but there is a limit beyond which you will not go. Jacob had wronged Esau. There was a conflict between these two twin boys, these brothers, these children of Isaac, Abraham's son of promise, the ones to whom God had given the promise of great things in the years to come. But they still had conflict with one another. They had conflict with one another, but look at what happens during their reunion. Love stopped Esau from going too far. Esau could have killed Jacob. And if he had killed Jacob, I doubt that anybody would have questioned him in that day. But love constrained him not to go too far. I know you are angry with your brother or your sister or your father, or your mother, or your wife, or your mother. But this love constraining you not to go to that. Is the love of God in your heart telling you that yes, they've done wrong, or you've done wrong, but don't go too far? Is the love of God telling you that it is enough, that as far as you have gone, you have gone is where you need to stop? 
Oh. Love mitigates our rifts. As children of God, yes, we have all of these rifts. We have conflicts formal in every relationship. But when the love of God is in your heart, it will keep you from going. Turn to your neighbor, look him in the eye, and tell him it is enough. Don't go too far. Amen. Love conquers all. Love marks our relationships as children of God. Love mitigates our rings as children of God. And let me close by telling you that love motivates our reconciliation as children of God. When we walk in faith and we walk in forgiveness. If you read the text, when Jacob first heard that Esau was coming, and coming with 400 men, Jacob was frightened. He was so afraid of what his brother might be planning to do. But I want you to know that the Bible says that Jacob prayed. Jacob prayed to the Lord. And he asked the Lord to be with him as he goes. Listen, look, as, I, as I look at it, turn, if you will, to chapter 32. Chapter 32 and verse 6. Put it up on the screen, if you will. Chapter 32 and verse 6. He says that the messenger returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he also is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with you. Go to verse 7. In the next verse, he said, So Jacob was what? Greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided the people who were with him. Go to verse 9. He says, Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, Return to your country and to your family, and I will deal well with you. Go ahead, verse 10. I am not worthy of the least of all the blessings and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become too company. Verse 11. Deliver me, I pray. From the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. Jacob was motivated by faith. You know what he did? God told him. And because of his faith in God, he went back home. It was the love of God manifested in his life and the faith that he had in God to whom he prayed. He went home because love motivates our reconciliation. When we walk in faith, you see, when people have wronged you or when you have wronged somebody, Sometimes you are afraid of full reconciliation because you don't know what that person may do to you. You may be thinking in your heart, if I go to them, they may reject me. If I go to them, they may try to hurt me like I have them before. But Jacob, motivated by his faith, walking in his faith, he said, Lord, I will go on anyway. Lord, motivates our reconciliation as God's children. When we walk in faith and also when we walk in forgiveness, Jacob said, God, I'm willing to obey you. I don't know what my brother is going to do, but I put my life in your hand. He went forward to do what God asked him to do because Jacob understood that if God asked him to do something, whatever he was asking, was for me. I know the thoughts that I have for you, said the Lord. 
thoughts of good and not of evil. To give you hope and to bring you to an expected end. Jacob understood that if God said go, that God was going to bring something good out of it. So Jacob, who used to be a trickster, Jacob, this great sinner, he overcame his fear because love had entered his heart. The love of God. And he said, I'm going back to my brother. Love motivates reconciliation when we walk by faith. Are you trying to reconcile with somebody that hurt you? Or somebody that you hurt? Walk by faith. God said do it. So do it by faith. Don't have to do it. Do it by faith. Don't do what Jacob did. Try to use his cunning when he should have relied on together on God. Do it by what? Faith. Do it by faith. The God who told you to return to your brother, your sister, your husband, or your wife. He's watching you and he's able to deliver you just like he delivered Jacob. God motivates our reconciliation as children of God when we walk by faith and when we walk in for him. Did you see in the text what he saw? He saw walking for him. He ran to his brother. He didn't run to him to kill. He ran to him to hug him. He didn't run to him to kill him. He ran to him to kiss him. He didn't run to him to kill him. He ran to him and fell on his face. And the two of them went. It had been too long. The separation had been too long. In some of our families, the separation. In some of our relationships, this separation has been too long. Some of us in our relationship with God, this separation has been too long. They went when they came back. Because this song chose to walk in for me. Are you willing to do like this song? Are you willing to walk in faith? Are you willing to walk in forgiveness? Are you willing to obey the law of love, knowing that love conquers all? I suggest that you do, because it is the word of God for you this morning. Love conquers the Father in the book. He had great danger in his life. But he overcame all of the hindrances, put his life at risk because of the love of his child. Love conquered fear. Love conquered hate. Love conquered sin. Love conquered offense. Love conquered Satan. Love conquers all. In our scripture reading, we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And one of the things it said to us about love, we said that love never fails. Love is the most powerful force in this world. It is more powerful than hate. It is more powerful than sin. It is more powerful than sin. You know why? Because the Bible said that God is what? And love is love. It was because of love that Jesus Christ, the Son, took the sins of the whole world on his own shoulder. It was because of love that God sent his Son into the world to die that whosoever believed in him should not perish. For that of the life. It was because of love that the Son of God called on the world and took my sin. 
Because because of love that the Son of God hung on the cross and took the us. Think about it for a moment. Think about all of our sin in this church. All of us. Think about all of the sins we have committed. Just those of us in this church. And think about the love that allowed the Son of God to carry all. But he didn't carry just the sins of us in this building. He didn't carry just the sins of those who are in church at 11 o'clock service all across the United States. He didn't carry just those sins. He carried the sins of the Christians. He carried the sins of those who hated him. He carried the sins of those who hung him on the cross. He carried the sins of those who tried to take his life. He took the sins of the whole world down from Adam until the U.S. baby that was just born. But love conquered all. Love conquered all. He died, yes, under the weight of the sins. He, he, he took his life. He died, but love conquered all, and he rose from the dead. With all power of heaven and earth in his hand. He rose because of the power of love. Love to encourage you, if you are a saint of God, let bygones be bygones. Don't your neighbor say, let bygones be bygones. And if you are not a child of God, if you've not been born again, let me tell you that today you have an opportunity to let your past put your past behind you. Accept Jesus Christ and believe and begin a new life. A new life not of hate, but the life of love. Because the same God who made it possible for any Jacob and his son to come together is the same God that is calling you on me right now by the Holy Spirit. Why don't you come? Why don't you rise to our inquiry and why don't you come as we let the invitation? Say, God, 